Hi, this is Chet Gladkowski, and welcome to our weekly Bible study. We're starting a new series on having a background that just didn't seem like it teed you up for a good life. Maybe you've got baggage in your background, and that's why this week's first message is all about a bummer of a background. I don't know about you, but if you've seen the movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, it really reminds me of my family. I remember just some of my in-laws and outlaws and people on my side of the family that were just so much fun to look at that movie and think, well, you know, that's just like me. And maybe you have felt that way. We all think, well, somebody else is dysfunctional, but is, and in the words of a friend of mine, I'm still looking for a single functional family among the dysfunctional families on this planet. And it's, it's, it can be fun looking back and poking fun at it like in that movie. But some of us have been really hurt. Let me, as we look in our background in our rearview mirror, think of these things. 25% of girls and 16% of boys will experience sexual abuse before they're 18. One in three teenagers report knowing a friend or peer that has been hit, punched, kicked, or physically abused by their partner, their whoever they're dating. 62% of tweens who are in a relationship say they know friends who have been verbally abused. And the numbers are staggering about violence in our homes, violence in our society in general, and we look on these things as tragedies. No one is a winner. And some of us respond differently. Some of us go to medication, either with prescription drugs or, or under-the-counter uh, illegal drugs or alcohol. Some people uh, try to medicate their pain by inflicting pain on themselves through cutting. Some people uh, lash out at other people, and that's how they medicate themselves. They try to protect themselves. And with all this kind of a background that you and I have, I'm a member of that brokenness. We want to look at the life of this guy named Jacob in the Bible because he comes into this world from a broken family. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, all these guys in the Bible, they had it all together. Not exactly. We hear of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if you're familiar with your Bible at all, or have seen any movies about the Bible. Abraham, this godly man, the founder of the faith that both Jew and Christian and Muslim revere. He was a liar. And when given a clear instruction by God, he added on to it. Boy, does that sound like you and me? And he had a son, Isaac, who's he was named Isaac, which means laughter, because his mother laughed when he said, you're going to get pregnant, and she laughed when God told her, you're going to have a child. And then she gets, uh, Isaac then gets married to Rebecca, and there is no child in their family, which leads us to Jacob, and we'll be picking up on him today. But you see, they all, all of these people in the Bible, this is one of the reasons I really like it and enjoy it, is because it's not these people who have got this glow around their head, perfect saints. No, they have faith, they have moments when they believe God, and they have moments of failure when God says, go straight, they're slamming on the brakes. God says, go left, man, they take a hard right or a U-turn. These are people just like you and me that had moments of faith, but moments of sheer panic and failure in faith. So let's read from Genesis 23. Isaac prayed to the Lord on his wife's behalf because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her and she said, what is this happening to me? So she went and inquired of the Lord. Well, first of all, in that culture, being childless was looked upon uh, with really that you were downtrodden, that they were poking their fingers at you, say, what's wrong with you? Why hasn't God blessed you? What's wrong with you? Something must be wrong. You're childless. And they received that and they went to God. Isaac went to God and he prayed to God, say, God, why? 
and God answered. There was nothing wrong with Isaac or Rebecca. They weren't living in some kind of hidden sin. It just hadn't, hadn't happened. And yet people were poking at them and criticizing them. Isaac prays and God answers. And she gets pregnant. Well, that's terrific. Well, maybe for a while, but then there are these two children inside of her and they're jostling. That means they're fighting one another. I wrestled on the ground with my brother when we were growing up. Imagine women, if you had two children inside of you and they were wrestling, that's what's going on. It's MMA in your tummy. And she said, why is this happening to me? Have you ever said that to God? Why is this happening to me? It's only been about four hours since the last time I asked that question. And so what did she do? She went to the Lord. She didn't Google it. She didn't post it on Facebook or Twitter it and look for feedback. She didn't go to her spiritual advisor. No, she went to God. Now, maybe here's a pattern we need to see. Isaac, what's going on? I don't know God. He goes to God. Rebecca, what's going on? Why is this happening to me? She goes to the Lord and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other and the older will serve the younger. God gives information that was hidden literally inside of her that she has twins and that there are going to be two different people Two nations, two families are coming out of her and they're uh, that they're wrestling both inside of her. But when they get out, there's going to be more wrestling. Just think about that. That's The answer is why it's happening to me. And he, God didn't say, oh, everything's going to be perfect. No, there's going to be two people. And by the way, the younger is going to serve the older through this fighting. So when it came time for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first came out red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. Well, that's interesting. We don't do this so much anymore today, but that when they saw the child or there was an attribute or something about him, that they took that name, and Esau means red or hairy. Now, I don't. it may not look like it now, but I could have been an Esau because I used to have red hair. But not anymore. We keep looking for the hair around the drain in the shower. And so he is comes out hairy and first, and he's named Esau. But after that, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Can you imagine this? I, I've never had a child, never going to have a child. I see uh, women who have experienced it. I listen to them. And giving birth, uh, my hat's off to you, ladies, for going through that. But twins, and not only twins, when the first one comes out, the second one's grabbing on and holding on to his heel. And they named him Jacob. And again, Jacob is an attribute about that child. Jacob means someone who trips. Because he's grabbing the heel, he says, you're going to be named Tripper. And they are both attributes, both in their birth, but also through their lives, because Jacob has a habit, as we'll see in the next weeks, he has a habit of tripping both himself and other people. You see, it may seem like this rough start. Jacob and Esau come out of their mother, Rebecca, and they're already fighting. He's tripping. They're fighting inside. And Jacob has a lifetime of tripping, a lifetime of tripping other people, tripping himself, tripping in front of God, wrestling both his brother, but wrestling with other people. And yet he is portrayed as a man of faith. The nation of Israel actually gets named after him when God changes his name from Jacob to Israel. And you see, there's a choice that is in front of us. It was in front of him coming out as a child, but having both good and bad. You can have a choice of your path. It can be a life of faith or a life of failure. It's in front of us. It's right there. Faith and failure have the same root, but then they, they spin off. Faith goes one way and failure goes the other. You see, we have some choices. Do I want to stay in the lane I'm in 
or do I want to leap over to another lane? Do I want to stay in the path of where I'm at, or do I want to move to where God wants me to be? Am I willing to change? Am I willing to look forward? Am I willing to, instead of always looking backwards, always looking at the what or the where or the why? God wants you and me to move from that what, where, or why, or how, and move to the who. This past week, I had a chance to visit with some friends, and I was just sitting around listening to some casual conversation when I started to have a, a talk with a young woman, and we'll call her name Mary. Now, Mary just, we're having this great conversation engaged. She's really a joy to be with. And I brought up something that I thought was a very minor point, very easy thing, just a question. And she lost it. Have you ever been with somebody who has just totally lost it? I don't mean just, well, I'm upset. And maybe you see people, they fold their hands and start. She started yelling and screaming at the top of her lungs. And I was just, what happened? And as I started to listen and ask questions, the prayer came through my heart. Oh God, what have I done? And then how can I be used of you? So I started to ask her some questions and she started yelling and screaming some more. And I couldn't understand what was going on. And then it was like the there was a playback to another channel of a conversation that I didn't really pay attention to just a few minutes before, where there was a conversation about how her father used to take her, her brothers and sisters, and other members, their family and friends, and other children, that he would drive them to church groups, church meetings, school functions, community events while he was drunk. You see, he had alcohol, he was an alcoholic and was drinking heavily in those day, uh, in her earlier days. And he picked up other children, other people, in, and took her and her family in the car while drunk. He since has gotten himself right with God, gotten himself right before people, attends AA meetings, and has been sober for a number of years, for which we are all thankful. But it made me wonder, has she given up being angry? Has she forgiven him about those things? And maybe this anger was coming out from that. I wondered about it. And as I began to ask her some more questions, we eventually got to Jesus telling the story about the prodigal son. And I just said to her, I said, you know, there's really good news here because the son was always a son and he came back. There was forgiveness there was reunion, there was restoration. Now, I didn't get his money back, but there was a restoration, a reunion, a reception, because he had always been a son. And the same is true for you and me, as you and I can be his son and his daughter. Now, we may run away, we may hide, we may spend everything on prostitutes or drugs, or in anger and bitterness and push people away. But if we're a son or daughter of God, we don't lose that. We will be his child. A child doesn't stop becoming a child. A child may run away. Or you could be like the other brother who sits around in arrogance saying, huh, look at the other one. I'm better than them. I've always helped out. I've stayed around. No, both of them are equally wrong. As a son, as a daughter, you and I have a choice. We can choose to be God's son and daughter. And when we receive Christ, he comes into us. He makes us his son and his daughter. And 
nothing can change that. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, or things to come, can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So you see, just like Jacob needed to move away from his background, and he came with a truckload of a background, so do you and I, all of us. So the question is, are we going to look and try to fight our way out, or are we going to look to the who? Look to the who that can redeem us, can rescue us, rescue us from ourselves, rescue me from my arrogance, rescue you and I from the bitterness of our past and the pain that maybe somebody else inflicted on us and we didn't really do anything to deserve it. It was their problem and we wound up being in the way. I once ran out in front of a car into the oncoming transit bus. Guess what? I lost. That was my fault. Not the driver's fault. I ran out in front. Maybe you've run out in front of a, a bus. Or maybe somebody threw you under the bus. Or maybe life happens. And you're sitting there in your bitterness and my bitterness and anger and resentment. But Jacob and you and I have a choice. Are we going to stay in the lane or are we going to look to the who? and ask him to heal us and forgive us, making us his son and daughter, and then always being able to come back. Because when we turn back and walk to him, he runs to you and to me. That is the challenge, to turn back, look to the who, and let him run to you and I. Would you pray with me? Our Father and our God, I thank you for who you are that you are the God who runs back to us. Thank you that you want us to be your son and daughter and did and paid the price in Jesus. And in his name, amen. Well, next week, we'll pick up on the next part of our study on Jacob and having a broken past. Thanks again. God bless and bye-bye.